Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the common room. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Doing well. Oh, it is good. This is, uh, well, our first time recording in a while. Mm -hmm. It's good to be back. It has been. As we watch Andrew, clearly he has not recorded in a long time. <laughs> I'm fumbling here. Where am I going with this? Well, I just want to get some light so that you all can see my shirt because of what we're talking about today. So it's just we all know that. it wouldn't be a common room without an Andrew flex. Oh, or yes. a number of flexes. I Those usually have to you... wait for the first 10 minutes of our call because he's showing us all the things that he's got. So it's like, all right, enough, enough. All right, now we're done. And I hit recording. He goes, oh, I've got something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, for those of you who are uh, thinking about your early Christmas shopping, I am assembling another complete set of uh, British first editions of the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, and I am also assembling a complete set of the American first editions of the Chronicles of Narnia. So... And he's including. sending one to Matthew and one to David. There's no, I'm sending something gift, to Matthew American and David. American version. <laughs> sending something to Matthew and David, but not those. So. <laughs> like, I love you guys, but not that much. Yeah. <laughs> Rightly so. ordered loves. If we learnt nothing else this season, rightly ordered. <laughs> yeah, I have rightly ordered my loves. I love my books, and I ordered them. <laughs> and soon on my eBay page, so you can, can you order them my too. eBay account. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have my new Tolkien shirt. Uh, that's going to be very customer. fitting for our conversation today. Fitting, it does. It does fit. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so we are recording this after the first two episodes of Rings of Power have dropped. Uh, the third episode is coming out tomorrow or the day after, depending upon where you live in the world. And this wasn't going to be the entire thing that we're going to do, uh, this common room, but it's kind of important in Inklings news. So I wanted to know, have you guys watched Rings of Power and what did you think? Yes. Yes. And what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> Since I probably have the more uneducated, common, proletariat take on this, <clears throat> uh, not not the Andrew Scholarly. Yeah, I would say my overall opinion was I was really nervous. It didn't hit the worst case scenario. I still think it has a chance to be above average, but it's honestly average to me right now. No. And I don't want to say the classic, the visuals were very pretty and the storyline was kind of subpar, but that is kind of where I'm at with it right now. I'm intrigued with Galad Galadriel quite a bit. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I think both of these statements can be true at the same time. I'm not sure if I am struggling with it because my expectations are so high from how incredible Lord of the Rings and is Tolkien, or if you could also say... The only reason I'm sticking around, and continuing and watching it, is because of that. Like, would I if if it wasn't for Lord of the Rings and the connection to Lord of the Rings, I'm actually not sure it hits the baseline where I'd actually watch the show. Um, personally, I think it's really because I'm like, all right, they, there's enough here that over a few episodes they can turn this into something pretty cool, where it could really start to develop. So there's intrigue. I guess you could say I am just barely on the hook. It's a very flimsy hook. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess that's my personal opinion. I'm not what a about you, David? I, kind of similar. Uh, I would say it's fine. Um, I was just a bit bored. Um, I actually literally fell asleep during the first one, which isn't a good sign. Um, <laughs> and yes, the visuals are pretty. It's the storyline's a bit meh. I could nitpick it until the cows come home. Uh, but the other thing I think is kind of weak is the dialogue. There's a couple of points where mm. it, you, you, you have a little bit of shining. Uh, so when mm -hmm. they're having the conversation in the woods, it's like, oh, this is picking up a level. But quite a lot of it is just, mm, this doesn't sound like Tolkien. You know, that's I really appreciate you mentioning that because that's one of my huge beefs with the Peter Jackson movies. Um, you can tell by the phrasing and almost hear the accent between... Um, Frodo and Sam and you can clearly see that Sam is of a lower class and that class um, difference is really pronounced in the Lord of the Rings and intentional I mean he's supposed to be a Batman he's supposed to be not a Batman but a Batman he's supposed to be a servant you know the the whole structure of I mean like in college you would have a scout um, uh, who would come and wake you up and bring you breakfast uh, in, in Oxford um, 
and a Batman was somebody who was assigned to you to kind of serve a, 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 a non-commissioned, you know, a, a, an enlistee um, a, serving an officer. And that distinction is really kind of lost. You have a, a vague attempt by Sean Astin at, at kind of Cockney, but the real kind of class difference, you know, when he says, Mr. Frodo, you don't believe it. But when you read Mr. Frodo in the books, you really believe it. And so, yeah, I wish that they had elevated that. My jury is still really kind of out, um, mostly because um, I think that it seemed to me like a series you know, like they are making nowadays. And they're going to develop the characters. There's going to be lots of mystery. You're not going to really know what's going on early on, but you're going to try to get sucked in. And so, and I think that they spent enough money on it that it's important for me to watch. That said, <laughs> I still haven't seen the last of the Hobbit movies. So, yeah. Yeah. Who do you think Meteor Man is? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I watched, actually, I'll send you all a link. There's a guy called Nerd of the Rings. Mm -hmm. um, or Lord, of the, Lord of the Nerds. Session. Oh, nerd, yeah, nerd, yeah. Nerd of the Rings. Matt. Nerd mm -hmm. of the Rings, yeah. And so he did a breakdown of the first two episodes. Um, I watched it with all my family. We were in Sarasota for the weekend. And so Kristen and all the, the, the brothers came over and we all watched it. Um, and I liked his breakdown and his speculation. Um, I don't know if there's enough evidence yet. I mean, it could be Gandalf. Um, but you just don't know. Uh, ironically, I, I thought I thought he was going to be Sauron, like the beginning stages of Sauron. He comes in and comes in the fire and stuff. But I guess so. I dude on that. the raft. The this guy was suggesting that maybe dude on the raft is Sauron. That's my that's my bet as well. I just have this deep sinking feeling <laughs> that that's who it's going to be, uh, and that he and Galadriel are going to have this uh, this somewhat. Hey, of Sauron's kind of a hottie. <laughs> well. You know, if we learn nothing from the latest round of Star Wars, is that like the bad guy? He he can be redeemed if he's if he's kind of cute. Um, oh gosh! But with Meteor Man, I think he's definitely a wizard. I would like him to be the blue wizard, just because he fits for the time period, and there's very little written about him. So fine, go ahead, do what you want. I've got this yep. sinking feeling he's going to be Gandalf, because they want to do a sudden <laughs> twist, and everyone goes, "Oh my goodness, I didn't realize." They're featuring mm. him prominently enough. And then who has heard of Blue Wizards except the folks who have really kind of gone deep on it? But mm. um, but they're, I think, appealing to a wider audience. So I would be surprised if he's not Gandalf now that I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Clearly, I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I it's will Yoda. say. Yoda. He's a young Yoda. <laughs> yeah. Baby Yoda. That would be the biggest twist of all time. <laughs> Oh, man, I remember going to one of the midnight premieres of Lord of the Rings. And, you know, this is, I think it was um, Two Towers that I went to. And um, somebody showed up and he had the, the, the big hat, the wide brim hat and the, and the gray cloak and the staff. And some wag behind me said, hey, everybody, look, it's Dumbledore. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. I'll make everybody's heads explode at once. There were also some Beowulfian moments. Did you notice some of those? The fight in the sea, like the fight with Brekka, uh, the appropriating the woman's sword. Um, you know, I mean, there. I think that there were some kind of conscious allusions to Beowulf. And, of course, Tolkien was one of the world's experts on Beowulf. There, there were a few things that I thought, oh, I'm glad you're at least trying on that, even if I didn't think it always already always landed. So one of the right. things that I was concerned about with this was the compression of the time scale. Because mm -hmm. this should take place over thousands of years. We should see men come and go. And, you know, so every season we need to swap out some actors. But they've basically compressed it all into one. Uh, and that's a bit of a shame. Because one of the big themes in the Silmarillion is about death being uh, Iluvatar's gift to man. That while mm -hmm. elves are uh, effectively immortal, they can, they can still be killed. But... Uh, but men die, that that is actually a gift to them and exploring that 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 tension. And I thought they, they at least tried to do that at a few points, such as um, when Elrond goes to see Durin and they have an argument because he hasn't seen him for 20 years. And to mm -hmm. Elrond, that's, oh, that's just like five minutes ago. Whereas yeah. for dwarves who can live for two or 300 years, it's a more significant amount of time. 
Um, I did so appreciate the, Durin a lot, by the way. <laughs> that banter when they were in and the pettiness, but then like it's an old married couple bickering and trying to... Well, I, I actually enjoyed that a lot. <clears throat> yeah. I thought it was a bit um, too petty, but it was still at least fun. And <laughs> Disa, I actually really liked uh it was yeah. it was lo- and just just the dwarven land in general it was nice to see it more fleshed out because we've only ever seen we've never seen uh the the dwarves dwelling when it's in ruins yeah mm. yeah no i think that that and that must have been fun to do as a as a set designer and as a director to to put all that together um just not to abandon our listeners totally to uh to you know this is not pints with ronald um <laughs> Although it's well worth celebrating. I was thinking this week as I'm working on some of my stuff in my Charles Williams class. One of the distinctives of Lewis and his deep friendships and his deepest friendships is that they write together. Um, and so you've got uh, the the long, the, 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 uh, the great war between Lewis and Barfield. Um, they do a series called Mark versus Tristram. Um, and... Uh, they cr- credit each other with some of the ideas in their early books. Um, of course, Lewis with, uh, I'm making the case right now in a paper that that hideous strength is Lewis's retelling of the place of the lion. You know, he's doing a Charles Williams novel. Um, but then they also write their Arthurian poetry together, you know, Talies and through Logers and that stuff. Um, and I'm like, well, L- T- Lewis and Tolkien didn't really write together, but then duh, of course they did. That first long poem, The Lay of Lethian, I wrote a paper about this too, was Lewis going through line by line and writing dozens of pages of criticism that Tolkien adjusted and took and and uh, even writing some poetry for Tolkien. And so in addition to the encouragement of Lord of the Rings, there's a real kind of heavy handedness in Lewis's criticism of, of Tolkien. And then as Steve Beebe has discovered, they were going to write a book or a book together on language mm-hmm. and Tolkien never started, but Lewis wrote the first chapter on the nature of language. Um, and so there were pr- projects planned together. So um, just a little ad for Jack as we're diving deep into Tolkien. And um, I don't know what he, it'd be interesting to know how much of the Silmarillion was read to Lewis or read amongst the Inklings because I don't believe it might not have been. I'm not sure. I'm sure parts of the Silmarillion he'd have had to have heard. I find it very hard to believe that he wasn't exposed to a reasonable amount of that because Lewis is the one encouraging him to continue forward. Yeah, Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But he probably had the real early stuff, you know, the Lay of Lethian and, and some of that stuff you know, was fairly early and not very well formed. And it doesn't, the Silmarillion doesn't get knocked into what passes for shape um, until the 70s, Mm. right? And so most of the Inklings time together is, so the Hobbit comes out in 36, 37, and the Inklings start meeting in like 33. So it's not much, I think, of the back myth that's going on in the Inklings, which is maybe partly why it doesn't cohere so well. It's hmm. good. Point. Anyway, you guys. But this is not this. Silmarillion. really, and this is this is uh, <laughs> appendices. So. You guys think with this Ring of Powers, is what they're doing bringing it right up to the Hobbit? Is that you think the goal over the five seasons? Uh, it and, should and is bring, there? It, you, you know how the Lord of the Rings opens with the uh, massive battle when Sauron has his finger cut off and the ring falls. Oh, yes. That should be the final episode of The Rings of Power. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and is any of this developed in... I've never read Sam, Sam Aurelian. Is some of it developed in there, or is that just like some backstory of Middle Earth that doesn't really explain this, so they're using that to maybe get some inspiration, but they're really essentially effectively writing a prequel to all of this. Like, how much is a Sam Aurelian, do you think plays a role in this legally they're not allowed (laughs) yeah so they have the appendices so at the end of uh the return of the king Mm -hmm. there's appendices i think a to f they are allowed to use whatever's in there and then it can negotiate with uh tolkien's company uh to allude to some things in the silmarillion um but that's the best they can do so in the first episode where you (laughs) 
I know. It's a lot of money for a few appendices, uh, a vestigial yeah. organ, if ever there was one. Um, but, for example, the trees that you see at the, in, the, in the first episode, mm -hmm. that, there's great Crazy. detail about that in The Silmarillion. Yeah, and yeah. it's one of the best bits. I'm, all, the early part of The Silmarillion is my favorite. That and Beren and Luthien. Um, yeah. But, yeah, they, there's lots of stuff that they can't touch, and that's why hobbits are now called half-foots. Because... Yeah, ah. <laughs> for contractual and they're reasons. Predecessors of yeah, and I think that there's also this sense though when you read Tolkien, and Lewis talks about this I think in his review of the Lord of the Rings, um, when you read Tolkien, you get the sense that you've stumbled across a a tell or a buried you know a burial mound like um like a uh, Sutton Hoo, right that you get this layer after layer after layer of civilization after civilization. And there's this antiquity already baked into, you know, and so you come across in the Lord of the Rings, it's our first time coming across it, but you come across these ruins and these things that used to mean a whole lot. And so with Tolkien, what you have is this sense that there's a much older world with its own stories that's that's uh, that's happening whenever we land there so even though this is the first or the second age and yeah you know, they drag some stuff in from the, the 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 first age um there are echoes i think of stuff that happened in the similar reign, which was earlier so do you think is why that... given given the price they were willing to pay for this and probably this will be the like maybe there's some future incredible staple work that comes decades from now again, but like that this is really a next big thing for a while. I wonder why they held that back, which could have been a tool to allow them to build a more robust, comprehensive, complete thing. Like this it almost seems like it's handicapping them. And this is part of maybe Tolkien's legacy a little bit. It's like, that. I don't know. I'm just kind of curious. Why do you guys think... Or they're just trying to be like, well, you know, we'll get another two hundred fifty million in a decade from now. I, I think there are two reasons. One of them is that we can sell it later. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I actually think, reading between the lines a little bit from what they've said, I think they purposely went for the second age because they would be less constrained because there are fewer mm -hmm. data points, mm -hmm. so they can kind of do what they like. Uh, there's less there's less canon to break if they do it in an age where there's less stuff that's specifically written. Now, the downside of that is you have less to work with. We, we mentioned the dialogue isn't quite up to snuff, and it's because they're writing themselves. Whereas had they done Silmarillion, there's much more that they could just directly pull from. Mm. But I, th I, th I think ultimately <laughs> they could sell the Silmarillion rights for an awful lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but it, yeah. and it's but it's also it, you know it's it's kind of a it's it's kind of a mess. And um, Tolkien mm -hmm. was very deliberate about writing the appendices and writing the Lord of the Rings, and that was the real work of his life. I mean, he kept correcting it and kept correcting it, and he was always eager for it. I just heard the story um, not long ago about how Clyde Kilby, the founder of the Wade Center, went over from Wheaton College in Chicago uh, to help. Tolkien write the Silmarillion. He even wrote a book about it. And at the end of the summer, where he spent the whole summer there trying to help Tolkien pull it together, Tolkien, you know, Kilby's packing up and saying goodbye, and Tolkien, with a twinkle in his eye, says, "See, I, you know, I, you didn't manage to make me do it. I, I was able to avoid doing it." And so he was a this, and I don't think that the Silmarillion. I don't think it has the kind of narrative cohesion. Um, that, uh, that that we have elsewhere. Mm. I still think I, I still think that would have if I had had the choice. That's what I'd have gone with. Because writing dialogue in the style of Tolkien is intimidating. Yeah. Well, if you could have hired a good stylist to do it, for goodness sakes. So, what no, do you think about the made-up characters about Arendir and Bronwyn? You know, the grim elf and the. I like, and I like, how come she doesn't I, take the wrap over from over her ears? Is she elf? That would that would be a fun reveal. That would definitely be a fun reveal. But I like both of those characters, and I I quite like the fact that we've got an elf that's much more stoic. Um, mm -hmm. It's you could argue it's not quite in the same vein as the other elves we've met so far, um, but it's basically kind of like uh, if I can cross franchises, it's kind of like Tuvok with a bow. 
Uh, I he know. Is, he, he, is, he is kind of more Vulcan than Elf. But oh, I'm actually quite is, enjoying that. Tuvok uh, is from... Uh, Voyager. Uh, it's from Voyager, yeah. What's Voyager? It's not a Star Trek series. Uh, I've never seen Star Trek. God, this is why you're not married. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen Star Wars now, though. Okay. Parts good. of it. Slowly dragging good. you into the 21st century. And into yes. the galaxy far, far away. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've actually quite liked the new characters. And I've, I've also liked the... Um, I've liked the half that's more than I thought I was going to. Yeah, as long as they don't elbow their way in. I don't know. I I might have to demur about the about the more serious elves because I think one of the great tragedies of the Lord of the Rings movies is they miss the miss the mirthfulness and celebratory nature. I mean, you know, never thought of that. Yeah, Gandalf or uh, Elrond as Mister Anderson. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he's too stern and too unremittingly stern, and that's not how Elrond is in the books. Mm. And when, and uh, I mean, the great scene that portrays is when they first come to, to Rivendell, right? Is it Rivendell or Lorien? And they're, they come to Rivendell and Rivendell, they're like joking with them and laughing about them. When they come to Rivendell in the movies, they're like surrounding them with swords and arrows and stuff. It's like, it's cooler. where's the hospitality and the humor and the gaiety and the dancing and the songs and all of those things that, 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 that uh, enchanted Sam and and uh, and Frodo and all the rest of them who who loved elves. So and, I don't um, know. Have you have you talked to or has Diana Glyer posted anything of her thoughts on the Ring of Powers? I'd be genuinely curious her thoughts on the Ring of Powers. Yeah, she hasn't, as far as I'm aware. Serena Higgins, who's um, yes, the, I followed her who, tweets. Yeah, yeah, she kind of live tweeted from the from the <laughs> premiere. What did you think of what she had to say, David? Hi. As with a lot of criticism and praise, I'm generally not going to disagree. I think most people have identified what's good about the show and where it's weaker. Yeah. There's, there's, there there there's aren't too many opinions that have been offered that I think, no, that is wrong. Um, mm -hmm. It's just yeah. unsubstantial you know, praise that I just feel is based on nothing and criticism that just seems to be like, that's criticizing nothing. Yeah. And there's a chance that the, the criticisms, at least from my perspective can be redeemed like i mean i guess obviously any criticism can be redeemed but for me it's that i just haven't felt that i've gotten into the story in a deep way from the character mm -hmm. side of things but since there's so much i mean two or three episodes that can change drastically um, and the visualization will most likely stay beautiful so i feel very comfortable the pros will stay very much a pro for the rest of it and the cons that i'm struggling with a little bit relative to some other shows i normally like to watch has a chance to really, you know, a few episodes start to get there, potentially. So, I think you I'll, could say um, that the criticism yeah. that stands, though, is a lot of people said that the first two episodes, and remember, this is two hours. It hasn't really grabbed them. Yeah. And yes, I, think, I haven't been like grabbed. I think grabbed that yet. was a mistake. They needed yeah. to have those first episodes be a bit more grabby. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe, I, not, it, maybe not do the half foots or maybe not do the elves. I don't know. Drop something out yeah. of there and go a little bit, a little bit deeper. And make, I mean, give us a character yeah. we really care about. Well, and I would have loved to have heard more about the trees, you know. I mean, portraying things that we have only read and never seen, right? They have this incredible opportunity to portray parts of Tolkien's world that we haven't seen before in the, you know, 300 hours that Peter Jackson has given us. Um <laughs> So, yeah, I, yeah. I was just gonna say. I mean, I think David, you're spot on with that. Um, the thing I would say is, I think they're gonna get lucky slash bailed out because of Tolkien. Going back to what I mentioned in the beginning, I think I'm watching it in great part because of that. And so, I think the grace I will give to get to episode five, six, or seven that I wouldn't give a normal TV show is very high. And so as long as they grab me in a deep way by then, I will get hooked to it and watch it. But I agree. This was a slower hook than a typical yeah. TV show for two hours in. So I, you got to ask the question, who's the audience, right? As Steve Beebe would, would, would urge upon us, uh, mm -hmm. exhort us to do. Um, and the obvi the audi well, I don't think we're necessarily the audience. I don't think you pay that much money for the Tolkien nerds, you know, and for the Lewis Tolkien fantasy folks. We're already there. 
right? <laughs> and so, and but 25 million people watched the premiere, which is, I think, a record um, on on Prime. They say, and so, they say that many people watched it. Colin yeah. a little cynical. I'm not so sure, but. Conspiracy theory, David. <laughs> well, the, the fact that Amazon have blocked all of the comments and they said it was just going to be for seventy-two hours or something, and we're already beyond that. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a little cynical that maybe <laughs> the giant, the, co- the giant the corporation might not have our best interests at heart. <laughs> have you seen the funny meme though of of the, when Biden's typically putting? Um, it's either Biden or Obama's putting uh, Obama. He's usually putting medals on people. Medals on people, and it puts Bezos with Bezos, putting a medal on Bezos, and because he co- they stopped the negative comments, <laughs> and so it's like we did a great job with this. My favorite no meme is the, is the one where um, it shows it says Jeff Bezos is worth one hundred and fifty two billion dollars. There are seven billion people in the world. Bezos could give every single person a billion dollars. <laughs> And still have plenty to go around. <laughs> it always so. makes me laugh when people do that. Yeah. My favorite one is when people say, Elon Musk and I paid $12 billion in taxes last year. <laughs> Combined. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the part I will say is, yeah, so the audience, is, the question is, who's the audience? Who are they trying to grab? Because we're going to be down until they really violate us. So the people yes. who know some Tolkien, we're going to be in... We're going to dutifully watch it, even if it's mediocre, until they really start doing something horrible, like, you know, making an elf fall in love with a dwarf in The Hobbit or something like that. A made up elf, for God's sakes. And Hunky <laughs> Hunky. I really loved that, to be honest. I'm not sure, Andrew. I think you're putting me in your category. I think I might be the regular category here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. With a slight bridge where I am probably slightly above average grace period to be hooked, but I'm by far. By no stretch, like some Tolkien and scholar or anything. I'm just like I want to be entertained, and that's about it. Well, and that's yeah. I mean, there may be there's there's certainly a bit of of you in there. I think the other piece that I that I'd suggest is that a a medieval author uh, who uh, that was of course Tolkien in Lewis's areas of study, a medieval medieval author like Thomas Mallory takes a story or several stories and mashes them together, chops off the parts they don't like, adds more of the stuff that they do like and passes it along. So in that sense, you can look at Shakespeare who only had three original plots or three original plays. Everything else was an adaptation. And he's operating very much like a medieval author who's taking a story that's not really, that's not exciting enough and adding excitement to it, taking out dullness from it and then passing it on. And so I, I gave Peter Jackson a wide, uh, a, a wide berth because, or a, a wide pass because he has the right to tell his version of the story. Andrew Adamson, who directed Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, said, I didn't want to direct the book. I want to wanted to direct my memory of being a 10-year-old boy reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And so he didn't reread mm-hmm. Lion. He filmed his memory of it. And that's a fair thing for the director as storyteller to do. In the same way, especially with this, as you pointed out, David, this less developed material, I think that it's almost medieval. And I wonder if Tolkien might on some level be intrigued by these these you know showrunners making their version of what they've got as long as they don't really violate and as long as they add to the enjoyment. I just don't know if I've gotten any enough additional enjoyment yet. Did you yeah. enjoy Elon Musk's tweet, uh, <laughs> Tolkien's turning in his grave? <laughs> a little dig at Bezos. They have a little oh, wow. competition. It was, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was about as direct as you can get, essentially saying this show sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I, 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 I like your idea, Andrew, that Tolkien would think, hmm, this is medieval. I rather like it. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I've read what he's written about somebody sent him a, I think it was a draft of a script or something like that or an adaptation. And he just, he, he was very harumphy. He wasn't having any of it. It's kind of like when yeah. people approach Lois to adapt the, the, the Chronicles of Narnia. I, I, I think both of those men would have been very hard to please. No, I, well, I, think, I think Jack would have been easier to please. Um, 
uh, I think Tolkien got more and more inside himself and, and kind of navel gazing with the Lord of the Rings. And he actually ends up saying things that really aren't true, you know, um, by the end. And the further he gets away from his creation, the more that he only likes his own work. Um, uh, you know, early on, he acknowledges his, his debt to George MacDonald. And then later on, he disavows it. You know, at one point in his later work, he says, oh, well, Lewis and I were never on a first name basis. I'm like, OK, great. The only or no, we never called each other by our Christian names. I'm like, you know, what, Tolkien, the only way that you could justify that is if you will acknowledge that Jack wasn't his his Christian name. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I mean, yeah, Tolkien gets more harumphy. Lewis thought that it would have to be kind of ridiculous um, and compared the, you know, he didn't want Disney to get a hold of, of the Narnia books. But I think that if the technology had been in place, um, he would have been okay with an adaptation. And as much as I really didn't like uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, what I did like was the dragon. And when Eustace is flying, I turned to my friend and I said, that's how dragons are supposed to look. Right? <laughs> that's how they must have looked like. Right? That's a real life dragon. You know, so... I think t I think Lewis would have been okay with it if they could have done it well. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, we're at the half hour mark. We didn't get to do the other thing I was going to do, so we will just do that next time. I think we'll wrap it up there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was enjoying the silence. Everybody. I, I was like, let's remember. see how long. Who breaks this first? <laughs> I'm trying to well, remember I'm, what the other thing was that we were going we to do. It doesn't matter. We'll do, we'll do it next time. Okay. I'll just uh, cheers you all. And remember... Uh, don't be like rocks that only look at the darkness. Be like boats that look up at the sky and the light. Oh, oh. To see rocks falling on them. Oh, wait. That's not the right thing. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>